Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Gabrielle Raymond McGee, the Chief Operating Officer of the Tory Birch Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. The whole purpose of these webinars is we want to help you navigate this COVID crisis as a business owner. And in our last webinar, the morning of uh, PPP loans had run out. And so during that webinar, we talked about what this means. We were hopeful that it was just a pause and eventually we would be hitting play. And thankfully, we were correct in that. And late last week, Congress voted for additional PPP funding of the tune of $310 billion. Um, we know that that sounds like a lot, but it's gonna go fast because there are so many people in the queue already. And so today, we wanna talk through what actions you need to take today, what resources are out there, and how you can get, we know it's frustrating, confusing process. So we, we hope that you, you come away with this with more information, more confidence, and hopefully more calm too. Um, so I'm so thrilled that we have two of the leading financial experts in our country here today. We have Lisa Mensa, who's the president and CEO of Opportunity Finance Network. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Um, yeah. It's great to have you. We know you're very busy and we so appreciate you taking time. Um, for those of you that don't know OFN, OFN is a national membership organization that supports CDFIs. So CDFIs are community development financial institutions. I know that's a real mouthful. mouthful. <laughs> yeah. But over the last six years, um, through our capital program with Bank of America, I've gotten to know OFN and have learned so much about CDFIs. And they're just this incredible untapped resource for small business owners. So we're so thrilled to have Lisa talk us through what CDFIs are, how we can tap into them, and how they can help you navigate. Um, Lisa, Lisa put it in our calls that CDFIs are really our financial first responders. And so we want you to have a relationship with these financial first responders, and we'll go into more detail in a bit. So thanks again, Lisa. Thank you, Gabrielle. We also have Megan Gorman. Megan is one of the most brilliant financial minds in our country. She's a senior contributor editor for um, Forbes Finance. She is the managing partner at Checkers Financial Management. She's a tax attorney. She knows the ins and outs of financial fitness for individuals and business owners. And today is Megan's birthday. So we're so excited that you're here, Megan, on your birthday. Thanks for making time. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really excited to hear a bit more from Lisa about OFN as well. And then we'll talk about PPP, which is sort of my favorite subject over the past two or three weeks. So looking forward to it. You're one of the few people that it's, it's their favorite subject. So <laughs> well, we're excited to get that passion and learn more. Exactly. So the good news, as I said, is that there's no, more funding for PPP loans, um, $310 billion. We know for so many people on this call, it's been a frustrating, confusing process. Sites have crashed, phone calls have gone unanswered. And so for Lisa, Megan, for everyone on this call, what's the, the action step that everyone should be taking today in navigating this new funding? So Lisa, I'll let you go first because you're coming from the banking perspective. Well, thank you both. And I think I will speak about to the business owners who are now desperate for the kind of lifelines that our government has tried to put in place. And the government is working through existing lenders. And I'm proud to represent the existing lenders who are really mission lenders, who've been out there on the front lines for nearly 40 years trying to get financing to small businesses, to facilities, to housing. And in this case, we're really talking about small businesses. So for a first step, I want people to meet their local community development financial institution. And not everybody goes by the name CDFI, but it's some of the community banks, loan funds. I want you to meet us. And I want you to be able to have, if appropriate, a relationship with uh, the kind of lenders who I think will be by your side 
not only now in the crisis, but in the, uh, but in the future. So my first step is get to know us. Great. Excellent. You know, I think a good place to start today, one of the big headlines that's come out about the second round of funding for PPP is that what they're finding is that- Megan, you're echoing a bit. I'm sorry if I don't, I don't know what's causing that. Hmm. Do you happen to have headphones or? No, I don't. Um, I do not know what's causing that. Um, any it suggestions? Seems better when you come, it seems better when you come closer. Is that better? That's Is that better? better? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. So okay. one of the big headlines that came out today about PPP that's really exciting is that the loan size is dropping. And so what that's telling us is it's not the bigger companies that are getting funding now, but it's the individuals or the small businesses, the self-employed people. So I think the thing is what, what I think most of us should be doing today is one, learning about PPP and two, organizing our finances to be able to participate in it. I think that's gonna be a really important step for everyone in maximizing PPP. Great, and I, I think the, the headline is move fast, right? Because there are already so many people in the queue. So this that's money is going to go fast. So sprint to your lender and we'll talk through who, you, who your lender is, which is the first question, right? So it could be the bank where you have a bank account, it could be a CDFI if the CDFI is offering PPP. It could be a FinTech company. So we'll go into more detail in a little bit on that front, but key message is move quickly, right? Exactly. Yeah. You have to move quickly, but you need to be organized. Mm -hmm. Great, and Lisa, we've talked a little bit about all these different acronyms, CDFI, OFN. Um, can you break it down for, for everyone on this call? What is a CDFI? Um, I really just love how you put it that it's the financial first responders of this COVID crisis and beyond. Um, I, I've loved learning more about CDFIs, but break it down for everyone. What is a CDFI? What are the resources they offer and how do people access them? So thank you again, Gabrielle. So we are all mission lenders, and that means we are organized to serve the borrowers who need us and that may fall outside of the traditional financial channels, meaning you might not have had the FICO score that your local bank needed. You might not have the uh, years in office. You might be living with a criminal history. You might have come out of a different walk of life and you need a, a chance at getting your business lending. And for the CDFIs, remember, we're loan funds, we're banks, we are serving women. 85% of our borrowers are low income and uh, nearly 60% are people of color and nearly 50% are women. So we are embedded in our communities. We are lenders that often come from our communities. If you've known, you may not know some of our acronyms, but if you've heard of Axion, they are a lender to many small businesses. The Black Business Investment Fund in Florida, the Latino Economic Development uh, Center here in our Washington DC where I live. But there are also credit unions, credit unions like Hope Credit Union in Mississippi, or Self Help that works in North Carolina and Chicago and California, or even native credit unions like the Lakota Federal Credit Union serving the Pine Ridge Reservation. And then there's CDFI banks. So there are depositories that are CDFI banks. And these are things like Southern Bank Corps in, our, in Arkansas, or City First in Washington, or Virginia Community Capital. So banks, credit unions, loan funds, all financial institutions that are here for the long haul, for the markets that have often been missed. And so the reason I call us financial first responders is because we've been through other crises, natural disasters, fires, the recession. And what we found out is while many mainstream institutions had to pull back then, we were able to lean in. So some of the uh, CDFIs were ahead of the government before there was PPP uh, loans. They were organizing with foundations, with city governments, with uh, local foundations to create funds. 
Some are offering these PPP loans. Some were left out, unfortunately. Uh, but I think you will find in our CDFI community the kind of partners who can help. And uh, I wanted to, if I could, just uh, give an example of one of our CDFIs, uh, the Community Reinvestment Fund, that is one of our big offerers of PPP loans. So if you don't know this one, they're active, particularly in the Midwest. But CRF has been doing quite a volume of, uh, of PPP loans, and we wanted you to know of their uh, resources too. So I'll take a pause, but my main uh, point is that the government in its new reissuing, um, yeah, thank you. I wanted to show the, the, uh, the slide about community reinvestment fund, but when the government did this second tranche, Gabrielle, they said, we want to work with community financial institutions. And so this included the CDFIs, the minority depository institutions, the SBA certified development country companies and other intermediaries. So this was really an important move in this next tranche to get more certified. And uh, I just want to say, if you, have, if you don't know where your CDFI is, I hope you'll go to our website. And I think Donna has a slide of this of the locator, right? Because that's always the question is yes, exactly. are there geographic challenges or yeah. how I think you have a, a zip code. Thank yeah. you. Just remember the three letters O F N, Opportunity Finance uh, Network. That's our that's our website. And we have on there something called a CDFI locator. It gives you a way of finding where there's a CDFI in your vicinity or who serves your area. Each of these CDFIs are unique. They have different standards, different markets, different niches, different rules. And I think though that you'll find, uh, this is the easiest way for a, a national uh, look at CDFIs that are serving your area. Great. And so Lisa, someone, if they're looking for a CDFI, they'll go to this website, enter their zip code, and all the CDFIs that are closest to them will populate. And right, so- correct or working in their area. Like you may be, it may be a CDFI that's sitting in Chicago, but will work further. Will help, okay. That'll, that'll be. And so CDFIs, um, they are an alternative to banks, right? That might have more flexible, um, whether it be lending um, parameters for women entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are people of color that are getting turned down from these banks. Um, not all CDFIs have the PPP loan program, as you right. said, but if they don't have the, the PPP program, they may have a uh, emergency relief program, right? They may, they may be tied in to what's happening in the locality. And, you know, these are people that are also working in their living rooms and, uh, you know, trying to stretch through this crisis. But I think they will eventually be the kind of partner you will want to have by your side. So uh, over time, I think even if they can't get you a PPP loan today, these are, if you haven't worked with one and you're the kind of business that may have ha struggled with other uh, financial partners, it's why we see Goldman Sachs or Bank of America referring people to our CDFIs. So, I hope you'll use this moment to find our locator, find somebody. And I think there's just some good souls out there. Some are banks already, they're CDFI banks, you know, so they are in the mode to help. They're gonna take a little more time. Often the way they're structured, they can do both the technical assistance and the lending. That's been the secret sauce of CDFIs. A little more time, it's a little more old fashioned, frankly, but there's a little more of a relationship with many of their borrowers, so. And the technical assistance is key, right? It's not enough to take a loan and then not know how to make it work for your business, right? Correct. Um, Correct. Through, through our capital program with Bank of America, I know um, we've distributed more than $54 million in loans to 3,500 women. And what we're most pleased with is that women are getting capital that's low interest as opposed to going to loan sharks or other alternatives that would get them in a more precarious spot as a business owner and the technical aspects of 
What does your cash flow look like? If you have really bad credit, uh, CDFI might not be able to give you a loan, but they can get you to a better place, right? Right. Often the CDFIs will work with people to build up their credit or to take the first steps. They are sometimes their credit builder loans. Sometimes they have other products that they can help. So I feel like they're on the journey with you. Mm -hmm. And many of our CDFIs are proud when their businesses graduate and do better and go on to other sources of finance and other markets. And so, but we're often here at the stage that a business hasn't been able to leap into the first other stages of traditional capital. Or sadly, uh, sometimes people get started with the wrong kind of uh, capital. And we are refinancing people out of uh, a situation where they got a mismatch. And we believe in fairly priced credit for businesses. And uh, you know, no hidden uh, features in our loans. So often we are a second chance for businesses to get on the right foot. Lisa, I think you bring up a really good point that has started to, people started to realize as we've gone through the PPP process, which is relationships and building your business are key. And I think a lot of people need to come out of this crisis and out of what they've learned from the PPP situation, thinking for my business plan, who am I going to partner with? And it sounds like your organization is a great resource for them to, to help build these relationships. I think that's right. And I think we do need partners in almost every endeavor of life we do. And I'm proud to be with a set of lenders who see themselves in that role, who help people. And frankly, many of the businesses give right back. They also become peer trainers and become the kind of, of business role models or mentors to future things. So there's a virtuous cycle and it's, you know, it's a pleasure to see the function of money and lending still being embedded in companies and with other facilities about that's building communities. That's kind of why the first part of our field is still called community development. You know, most of us are in this work because we see it um, more than just gaining our daily bread, but you know, doing something that the country or our communities needs. That's great, Lisa. And you, you alluded to the fact that um, the CDFI teams, just like all of us on this call, are working from home with, I know I have a toddler running around, and um, it's <laughs> certainly not easy to work from home all the time. Um, so as far as communication is concerned, should people call or email um, everyone should know that it will take time to get a response, um, just right. like the banks, CDFIs are being inundated. So what, what do you recommend? Is it online or what's best for, for CDFIs around the country? I think we're all starting online and people put their phone numbers on. One thing I know is that our CDFIs have been working hard. When those SBA lines were clogged, they were staying up at night and trying to file applications at two in the morning and three in the morning. So people are really leading in. We, this is a time of, I think, compassion and people understand how hard this is. So people are really trying and I appreciate the shout out to the folks who are the long hours, but I'd start with the websites of the various, start on the email. Most have their phone numbers right there. And then I think you're gonna get a call back. And Hopefully we will get out of that, out of this time where we're all locked down and we'll be able to do things in person in the future too. And, uh, but I'd start with the web, start with our website, OFN.org, and then uh, find your CDFI and, and start that relationship if you don't already have it. Great. And Lisa, um, we touched on it a little bit, but um, obviously we're all reading reading and watching the news, um, seeing the dismal stats that women and people of color are not having necessarily the same success for PPP loans. Um, and certainly CDFIs are um, helping fight any bias or any um, challenges that we have as underserved communities, which is amazing. Can you share a little bit about the loan sizes? What, what typically is the loan size from a CDFI? What's the range? So people understand um, what they can apply for outside of PPP. Right. So the average of a CDFI, when we're outside of this moment, 
uh, our average size loan is about $44,000. But this ranges. There are some CDFIs who specialize in the micro side of this, who start with loans well under 10,000, under 5,000. And there's some that are in the quarter of a million and above. So we have a nice range of field. Uh, and that often depends on funding sources. Many of our CDFIs are already approved SBA lenders, both under the micro loan program, under the 7A community advantage program. So some of them are already well used to using uh, public programs or they're in partnership with banks. So I think no amount is too small for a CDFI, but we tend to be, as Megan pointed out, we tend to be at the smaller size of the market. We do work with uh, sole proprietorships. Uh, so it, it is kind of unique to the kind of program. I've been uh, delighted. I've been on native reservations. I've been in the deep mm -hmm. south. I've been in deep urban communities. Needs differ. Um, what we fight for is the relevance of the business for their community are the, are the other things. And, and that can vary. But we are a smaller size. Uh, what we were frustrated with politically in this moment is that when the Treasury established a threshold of $50 million in order for CDFIs to qualify to make PPP loans, it left out a lot of CDFIs because yeah. many of the portfolios don't have annual sizes of 50 million, of course, if you're making smaller loans. So part of what this last few weeks have about uh, have been let us in to the program, let us, and thankfully some are in, so that's yeah. good. We wish more work, but, um, you know, we're going to keep pushing for everybody to be able to play their best roles in a time when the country needs us. That's great, Lisa. And I was, I was really pleased to read that the new detail of the PPP funding is that $60 billion will go to community banks, local credit unions. So hopefully we'll see um, greater success in funding people of all backgrounds through that funding. And I know that $60 billion does not go straight to CDFIs. It's goes to many, many different groups. Um, but I, I thought that was a really good movement. So hopefully we'll see change. We, and, we all hope that. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting a ton of wonderful questions in the chat box and know that we, we've saved 25 minutes to go through as many questions as possible. Um, so I will get to those in a bit. But another um, key moment of the new wave of PPP funding is that there are more lenders. So in addition to CDFIs, credit unions, there are also fintech companies like the Cabbages of the World, PayPal, Square. So what are, what are your thoughts with more lenders? What do people need to know when they're exploring some of these fintech options? And let's start there. Yeah, if, if, uh, you know, I think first of all, I think it's great news that we've got more lenders because if you think about it, the way PPP started was the first group that could apply on April 3rd were small businesses, but self-employed individuals were not able to apply until April 10th, a full week later. And as we know, the money ran out on the 15th. Mm -hmm. But when all of these other lenders started to be able to add capability, it allowed some of these self-employed individuals to get access to monies. So what I have seen anecdotally is I'm seeing a lot of success with smaller businesses with the fintech firms, with the squares who run their payroll, with, you know, and, and, and uh, PayPal. I think that that is really, really good news because they're able to push liquidity to these small business owners. I think the biggest challenge we're facing is a lot of the small businesses know they can apply for PPP. I can't tell you how many times I've called friends and family who I know are self-employed and said, have you done PPP? Like you need to do this. And they're like, Am I, am I even eligible? And then when we started to, you know, go through the process, and I'm sure Lisa sees this a lot, is a lot of these people, because they're Schedule C, self-employed individuals, don't have a business bank account. So they couldn't get access to certain areas of the banking world. And mm -hmm. so what they had to do is look at other resources. And the nice thing is there's more resources out there today than there was when this first opened. So it's good news for all of us. That's great, Megan. And um, people, if they've already applied through their bank, my understanding is they can still apply through a CDFI that's offering PPP, a credit union, or a fintech. Um, 
and I know people had concern, like, would they be committing fraud if they're applying to two different places? And we certainly don't want to promote any um, any risk. So can you, do you have a clear answer on that? Yeah. Well, two places? The thing with PPP right now, right, is it's a law that's, in, that's unfolding in real time. And so what it requires of all of us is patience, right? Mm -hmm. Just to give some insight, SBA has released, since PPP has gone into effect, four different frequently asked questions uh, to help give us some guidance. So here's the thing, I, I, there's no real clarity about should you be applying to a number of banks? The, the, probably the short answer is technically no, you shouldn't because you're clogging up the system. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing from a practicality standpoint is people putting applications in to maybe like a bank and a FinTech firm and then pulling the other application once they move along in the process. So we are seeing that and we're seeing people successful with that. It's just, it's hard to figure it out. But I do think what is really important about what you said is you have to remember this is good. You're, you're applying in good faith. And if you don't apply in good faith, you can be basically guilty of fraud. So mm -hmm. tread carefully in your application. And we're going to get into this in a little bit about the application process. I, I think we're going to get into it right now, Megan. So <laughs> I love that you're passionate about PPP, you can explain to everyone tuning in here the step-by-step -step process, the ABCs of PPP, what people need to know. And in the meantime, I'll also look at the chat because I know so many of the questions are specific to PPP. So over to you, Megan. Thanks. Perfect. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. I've got a, a deck that I wanna walk us through. Um, so just let me, there we go. Okay, perfect. I think you can all see my screen. Is that correct, Gabrielle? That's correct. Okay, so, so I think the thing is, when we start to, to think about PPP, I wanna take a step back and just sort of frame it a little bit more because there's a great Mark Twain quote, which is history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I bring this up because we've been here before. It might not feel like that, but if you go back to the dot-com crisis, to 9-11, to 2008, we have been in challenging situations. And the good news that all of us have to keep in mind is that the government has reacted to crisis. And so what is really amazing is the CARES Act really is about pushing a ton of liquidity into the system. And there's a lot of great provisions to it, stimulus, unemployment, um, access to retirement accounts. What I wanna do though is spend the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes focused solely on PPP or the Paycheck Protection Program. And I'm gonna tell you out of the gate, I really like this program. I think it's amazing. And I think the fact that the government put this together to help all of us in small business, and, and I have a small business myself, is really amazing how quickly we've been able to get money out to people. I mean, we've asked banks to go above and beyond what normally happens and to get money to people. So what is PPP, right? We hear it all the time, it's on the news, it's in the paper. So it is a loan program available to small businesses and nonprofits with up to 500 employees and self-employed individuals, okay? These loans are gonna be made available from the Small Business Administration and Treasury approved banks and credit unions and now FinTech firms. And what's really unique here is you don't need to establish that you were unable to get credit anywhere else. There's no personal guarantees. There's no collateral required. And there's no prepayment penalties, guarantee fees, nothing. The government has sort of thrown open the kimono to give access to liquidity. And this is a big deal. And I can tell you as someone who has a small business, anytime you apply for small business loans, it's challenging. It's hard. So getting access to monies is going to be key. So how does PPP actually work, okay? So let me give you sort of the rough equation on how we calculate a loan, and then let's talk about what makes this loan sort of unique and, and in a way magical. So what the PPP loan is, is it's a stopgap. So what the government is saying to you as a small business owner or self-employed individual is that we're gonna give you the ability to get liquidity to pay your payroll costs for two months or eight weeks, okay? Because that's sort of the government thinking, okay, this is where people have vulnerabilities and they want to help us protect ourselves. And so what they do is they saying, look, 
the maximum loan amount is the average monthly payroll cost for the year previous, right? At times 2.5, times 2.5, plus any outstanding disaster loan that you took made after January 31st. But I wanna focus on the first part because it's the average monthly cost for the past year times 2.5. It is a very straightforward equation here. But if you think about it, if you've taken your monthly payroll cost and you receive it at two and a half times what it was in the previous year for this year, you should be able to cover your payroll. You should be able to get you and your people paid. And that is really important because if you think about the, the whole economy here, we're all tied together. It's like a row of dominoes. So if I get paid and I pay my people, they will pay their people and they will pay their people. We are all in this together. And that's what PPP does for us. So people are like, well, what are payroll costs? Because there's lots of different things, right? So, you know, some people get wages, commissions, salary. If you're a self-employed individual, right? You have your net earnings. You actually get payroll from yourself. And in both of those definitions, what's really important is the government isn't here to subsidize big salaries. Let's be very clear. They are here to help Americans who are trying to survive this crisis. And so they are looking at payroll costs up to $100,000 per person, okay? And this is gonna be important as we get through this from a calculation standpoint. They also look at cash tips or equivalents, vacation, parental leave, family leave, group health care benefits. So those are what we consider payroll costs. And so it's important to remember that that's going to be what we focus on with the PPP loan. And as I said, they're going to look at timing, okay? So we're sitting here on April 29th, okay? They're going to want us to look back at the past year at our average expense, average payroll, and they're going to want us to use the average that they give us to pay for payroll costs over eight weeks. And the period has to start from the moment you get your loan. That is some of the guidance we're starting to get from SBA. So as we think about this, when you get a PPP loan, you're gonna use it to cover your payroll costs and then other costs that you can use it for, and we're gonna have some caveats on this because there's, there's a process for PPP, is you can also use it for group health care, Interest on mortgage obligations tied to your business, your rent, your utilities, okay? Interest on other debt incurred before February 15th. So they're going to give you a few other things besides payroll to cover, but we have very strict parameters here. So what's the magic of PPP? Why is this so sort of exciting? Okay. So if it's used for its intended purpose, right, which is payroll, right? It's right there in the name. If it's used, we are going to be able to get certain payments forgiven. So think about this. This is crazy, right? They're going to give you a loan. And if you pay yourself and your people, they're going to forgive part of the loan. Now, the loan itself, just keep in mind, is a two-year loan. The first six months is deferred, okay? So there's no loan payments due. And that's going to be important because you've got to pay your people, pay your payroll costs. And at the same time, you've got to go through a forgiveness process. So there's two parts here. We have to get approval for the loan and get forgiveness. I'm gonna come back to forgiveness in a bit. Once the first six months passes, it's going to be another 18 months and the loan rate is 1%. So think about this. The government is giving you access to really cheap money. And so one of the things that a lot of us in the tax world are talking about here is if you get PPP, what we really need you to do is make sure you segregate the funds into a separate bank account, okay? And that's because we're going to wanna to make sure we're tracking the loan being used for the key costs that the loan is designated for, okay? Couple other things, just to reiterate this, no collateral here. You know, when, I sh when you see the application, it's four pages, okay? No guarantees, no, you have to say the business could get credit elsewhere. These loans are non-recourse, which is great, unless you use them for an unauthorized purpose, okay? Now, I will tell you, as I said, this is unfolding in real time. So Treasury and the SBA are giving us guidance on how to do all of these different pieces. We're, it's not, we don't have all the answers yet, 
And that's going to be important because one of the things that everyone really has to think about here is this is something that you need someone to help you with. So Lisa's talked about the bank and, and I think she brings up a great point. Banks are key in small business in building relationships. The other person or, or tool that you need is a tax professional. Banks and tax professionals can help navigate this process so that you are successful. So let me take you through a very basic example that I think applies to a lot of people who are on this webinar. And that is someone who's self-employed. And, and just so you know, a self-employed individual is someone who files what we call Schedule C. And I'm gonna show you the form in a moment. But you file your income on Schedule C, less your expenses, and you get your net earnings. So in this example, we have Julie, and she's a self-employed individual. And she files her tax returns, files a Schedule C, she has no employees. And when she looks at her Schedule C, and she drops down to line 31, this is why you need the tax professional, she sees a number of $80,000. And this is important because remember, I said you can't go over that $100,000 mark of income. So she's under $100,000, she's fine, she doesn't have to back out any additional income. So what Julie does is she takes her average income of 80,000, or her, her annual income of 80,000 for 2019 and divides it by 12. And so she will get $6,667, okay? That's her average monthly income. And look, I know from having a business, we all sort of are lumpy in our businesses, but we're gonna look at the average, okay? And so what's gonna be important here is on her PPP application, she's gonna put her monthly average income at $6,667, and she's going to times it by 2.5, and that will get her $16,667. That is her loan amount, okay? So it's pretty straightforward from a calculating standpoint, but what you have to keep in mind here is that in the scheme of things, you've got to fill out an application. So this is the top part of the PPP application. It's four pages. You as the applicant really only fill out two pages. And this is the most complicated part. The rest of it is all about if you have felonies, confirming you're a US citizen, and doing certification, which I'll get to. So Julie's gonna complete this. She's gonna put her name in, her address, her business info, and under average monthly payroll, $6,667 times 2.5, 16,667, and she has one employee herself. And then what she's going to do is select what she's going to use the money for. And for most people, it will be payroll, lead, utilities. And just keep in mind, these expenses had to have been on your 2019 tax return. I'm gonna show you the one other quick example, and that's Madison. She's also a self-employed individual. File Schedule C, no employees. But when Madison looks on line 31 of her, her Schedule C, her income is $180,000, okay? So what Madison has to do here is she can only claim up to 100,000. So she has to pull the excess out of her calculation. So she would take $100,000, divide it by 12, she would get $8,333, times that by 2.5, and her loan amount is $20,833, okay? And if you think about it, if Madison was you know, getting $20,833, that's the equivalent of paying her for eight weeks at a $100,000 annual rate. So again, she's being able to pay her income. Now, what's really gonna be important here, and this is why having a tax professional is, is key, is the banks are gonna ask you for data, okay? So if you're a self-employed individual with no employees, and I think there's gonna be a lot of people on this webinar who are like that, you have to submit your 2019 Schedule C. Now, as many of you know, we have moved the filing deadline to July 15th. It does not matter. The SBA frequently asked questions has specifically said it, if you haven't filed for 2019, still go and complete the 2019 Schedule C. You can get this form on the IRS site, and I'm gonna show it to you in a moment. You also need to submit your 1099s, okay? So this is gonna be important because they're gonna document the income you've had coming in. You need to submit bank records or statements showing you're self-employed 
and a submission of a 2020 invoice or bank statement to show you're in operation as of February 15th. Okay, so this is where you have to be organized and move fast, right? Because the bank is going to need to see this. They need to make sure it's a legitimate business. And listen, they're taking a lot of risks. They're not asking for collateral. They're not doing all the normal things they do with loans. So we have to make sure the data is in order. This is a Schedule C. And the Schedule C here is, as you can see, it says profit or loss from business. You're a self-employed individual. This is what you're completing with your 1040. This page flows through to the 1040. And you can see on the top of the form that I'm showing here, if you haven't done your 2019 tax return, you can download a PDF that you can complete at irs.gov backslash schedule C. So this is gonna be a really important form for you when you are applying for PPP. So if you think about this, the PPP application is key with the calculation, your schedule C, your 1099, and your bank records. But to be candid, in the history of bank loans, I don't think it's ever been easier. So this is something your CPA, your tax professional can help you do. Now, if you are a Schedule C filer and you have employees, you will submit your Schedule C and then you will also submit your payroll form from the IRS Form 941. And if you work with Square, ADP, Gusto, any of these payroll providers, they now have access on their site when you log in to hit a button and have that form download. Okay, and that's gonna be important. You can also include employer healthcare contributions or retirement contributions. In the interest of time, I just wanna go through one small business one and then get into forgiveness. If you are a small business, you're an entity and you have payroll costs in this situation of a million dollars in 2019, and no employee made more than 100,000, in this instance, we're gonna take the million dollars and divide it by 12. And the average monthly payroll is 83,333. We're gonna times that same way we did it for Julian Madison by 2.5, and the loan is gonna be $208,333, okay? So again, whether you are self-employed on your own, self-employed with employees, if you have a small business, the calculation is the same. And it's all about understanding your payroll costs. So what's really the key part- Megan, is, can I just ask one quick question? We keep getting questions about the tax filing. Um, so can you just clarify, mm -hmm. if 2019 hasn't been filed, people are asking if they should be using 2018. No. Okay, so the Small Business Administration released guidance, I believe it was April 21st. Uh, there's been four guidances released. In it, it specifically says that you must use your 2019 Schedule C. And if you haven't filed, they just want you to complete the Schedule C. You don't have to file, okay? okay. okay. So you can Thank go to irs.gov backslash Schedule C and you can download it or go to your tax professional. They can help you do it fairly quickly and make sure that that number that's in box 31, that's our magic number spot. They're gonna make sure that that it's accurate, okay? Great. And that you're actually asking for the right amount. So when you go through the process, right, and you get approved, and I will tell you, I've seen people get approved and two days later, boom, into their bank account comes the wire, okay? And into their bank account comes the wire and now that starts the eight weeks. Now we don't know a lot about forgiveness. So approval is part one, forgiveness is part two. To make the loan magic, you have to do part two as well. But what we do know is not more than 25% of the loan that you can get can be attributable to non-payroll costs, like paying your lease, like paying utilities, right? It's all about payroll costs. So my word, my word of advice to everyone is take this conservatively, okay? And what I mean by that is, you know, pay your people, pay yourself, but you have to do at least 75%. But don't hesitate, you know, if you're struggling as a small business to call your landlord and see if you can mitigate some of that stress there so that you're using the loan for your payroll costs, okay? Payroll is key, okay? We are going to get more clarification. We are waiting for it. It just has not come out yet. That being said, in loan forgiveness, you will lose or it will be reduced if you decrease your headcount, 
or you decrease salary and wages by more than 25% for any employee who made less than 100,000 annualized in 2019. But if you had you know, laid people off or you had reduced salaries before you got PPP, you have until June 30th to restore them. So look, if you get the PPP loan, pay your people. But this is also about business planning. And, and you know, as Lisa talked about, banks are great tools when you have relationships there to help you with your business and business planning, as is your CPA or tax professional. You have to make the best decisions for your business that will pay out in the long term. Mm -hmm. Just a couple other things here. Your loan will not be forgiven if you use it for anything other than payroll, mortgage on your business, lease, utilities, okay, for the eight week period. You go out and buy a car, you go out and pay your kids to education, boom, you are in trouble because you will be subject to fraud. You must, you are going to sign a certification that says you will use the funds for designated purposes. For forgiveness, we don't know the full process yet, but you will need to submit the documentation to the bank showing you use the funds appropriately. And the lender, from what we know right now, will have 60 days to make decisions on forgiveness. Megan, so one, of, one of the questions that just came through was if you can apply for unemployment and PPP. Can't double dip, one or the other, okay? And that's gonna be key because what, if you think about it, right? Think about it from a, from a practical standpoint. The government is saying, look, we get the fact that some people are gonna have to go on unemployment, but we also get the fact that some businesses can survive and can pay their people. So it, it's one or the other. You can't double dip, okay? Um, last thing I just wanna to touch on before we get to questions, and I know I've been flying through a lot of this, so I'm happy to answer questions, is certifications. This is a serious loan. You cannot go and use it for other reasons other than payroll protection, okay? If, if you do, you will be charged with fraud and they are not gonna mess around with this. We saw Secretary Munchen yesterday start to talk about this. They are not happy with anyone who starts to go off, you know, off track with these loans. They have an intended purpose. So you will have to certify and sign this when you submit your loan application. So this is very serious. That's why I think having a tax professional walk you through this and make sure that you do the right things is gonna be key for you to work with your bank. So I'm gonna pause right here because I know we wanna get into questions, Gabrielle. I hope I didn't go too far over. Right. I think it's just really important to, um, you know, if they have questions to just keep sending them in. That's great. Um, so I'm just gonna grab a few here. So um, my bank says I'm approved for PPP, but they were waiting for a government portal to reopen. I'm self-employed and now two months behind and plan to use this as retroactive pay for March and April. How do I do that as lump sum or bi-weekly as I normally do? Um, so you, you technically have to use it for the eight weeks after you get the loan, okay? So you can't go retro. So again, this is a prospective loan and you have to be very, very cautious with that, okay? So do not use it to do back pay. You need to use it. So if you got the loan today on April 29th, you have eight weeks from today for prospective payroll. And again, talk to your tax professional. They can help you with other ideas that are out there that could help for, for the backlog. Great. And Megan, so many people tuning in are, are new. They just started their company. Um, so one person is asking if they just started their company back in July of 2019, how do they calculate monthly payroll? Do they divide it by 12 or six or how does that work? When yeah, you so what you're starting out? Suggest is, you know, if you started it in, in July, right? And I can say this is someone who started a business. They actually will let you look, you can pick the year you use. So you could use a prorated year there. So I would use July to March 31st to see and divide it by, I think that would be nine would divide it by nine. Again, talk to a tax professional to make sure the number's right. The challenge is if you started a business, it is highly likely in 2019, if I was to look at line 31 of your Schedule C, that you were in a loss. If you're in a loss, you cannot qualify for PPP. That is a problem, okay? And that's where you're gonna have to think about other options like unemployment. Got it, okay. So is that, can you break that down even more? So if you, are at a loss from a revenue perspective or? Yeah, on line 31, your net earnings, let's say I'm sitting there and last year was my first year in business and I'm sitting in a loss of $20,000. I cannot apply for PPP, right? That's not going to be an option for me. Now I can go a couple of different routes. The first is unemployment. 
as a self-employed individual, they have under the CARES Act for a limited period of time broadened who can apply for unemployment, okay? And self-employed individuals are now in that group. So if you think about it, there's lots of different levers we're pulling on to get liquidity to people, right? Mm -hmm. So you would apply for self for unemployment in your state. I'm sitting here in the state of California. I know of people who are self-employed who are getting it here. And then the federal plan layers on top and it's an additional $600 a week, okay? So that would be your option there. Now, if you are, you know, I will tell you there are some other tools in the toolbox. If you potentially qualify for PPP, but don't get the loan because the funds run out. One thing I want everyone to call their CPA or tax professional about, because you can't do this on your own. This is something that's so complicated, is something called the employee retention credit. And this is also available to people who have employees. So if you have a business and you didn't get PPP, because you can't apply for PPP or the, and this credit together, you can't double dip, call your tax professional because you can get a tax credit of 50% of qualified wages up to 10 grand for, for employees. So that's a $5,000 credit. Now remember, because the way this works, it's a little bit harder because tax credits, it's delayed to get access where PPP is gonna be an infusion of cash. But this is a backstop for people who have employees who wanna keep their business going, but, but end up not getting PPP. And so people will talk to their CPA, um, but if they don't have a financial advisor or an accountant per se, where would they go to learn more about this? You know, there are, so first of all, I've been involved with a big, you know, a lot of people talking nationally, the tax community has come together on this. We want to help people. Um, it is not a bother to call us. We want, we want to get people money. And so to, to be able to survive. So what I would tell you is look at resources like the AICPA, which is the big national CPA organization, or look for local CPAs in your community or in the business world, or even ask your other advisors who they would suggest. Financial advisors, your insurance people, you know, all of them know great CPAs and tax professionals who can hold your hand. And this is going to be important because at the end of the day, PPP is part of a larger strategy. It's a strategy to have your business survive and thrive. And so this shouldn't be a one-off where you're working with someone to help you because tax people and bookkeepers were sort of trained to look for opportunities to help you. And that's going to be really important going forward, particularly, and, and with PPP, I can't emphasize enough, this forgiveness thing, you've got to do it right. You do not have an option to mess up. And because what happens if you don't get forgiveness is now you have to pay back the full loan. And that's not what we want. That is not the intent of the CARES Act. And Congress, the president, they all want these loans to be forgiven because they want you to survive. Mm -hmm. um, um, we're getting a, a number of questions about credit qualifications for PPP. You know, I, I'm wondering, Lisa, do you have any insight into that? Because you're seeing it on the bank side. Yeah, there was no FICO score required for this product. And uh, people were not, uh, because there is a, there's a line in the legislation that says you couldn't determine uh, the FICO score of the business or the cash flows of the business at a time when there was no cash in the economy. Mm -hmm. So they were intentionally not to be scored like uh, normal small business loans. Great. So, and remember, this program was eligible for not just small businesses, but nonprofit enterprises as well. Mm -hmm. So it's had to be, we're on a webinar for small businesses, but it was supposed to be big enough to let a variety of uh, applicants in the door for this kind of payroll stabilization. Got it, great. And um, we did have a few people ask if they applied and asked for too much in the PPP, how do they edit what they've asked for, Megan? Well, first of all, I mean- If they didn't calculate things properly. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna be really honest here in the sense that when they first launched PPP, they didn't have true guidance for us. I mean, I was in tax conversations with people where we were debating what to include, what not to include. I think the thing is all about the documentation you submit that's going to back it up. So if you're a small business, and you know, you're submitting your payroll, the bank is gonna be able to see that. I am assuming, and I'd love to hear Lisa's point of view on it, but I'm assuming they're gonna push back on it. Um, in all the instances I've seen, I have seen people more under apply to be conservative, to make sure they get it than anything. Mm -hmm. 
It's a tough question because many banks are asking you to self-certify. So I think Megan's coaching as well. Try hard. This isn't, uh, you know, it's not a difficult calculation, the 2.5, but it is this $100,000 cap that was, that was tricky. So I know our lenders are a little more hands-on. So, uh, but many banks who are doing this in huge volume, and thank God they've been able to do it in huge volume. This is, they've asked for self-certification. So. Lisa, we have a number of questions for you. So if someone lives in one state, but their business operates in a different state, what's the best um, way to find the appropriate CDFI? Should it be where they live or where they operate or it doesn't matter? Try to get close to where your business is. But in some ways, we're a relatively small network. So I think people will tell you if they know they can't serve you, if their you know, funding source uh, means that they're really dedicated to a certain geography. But try to get close to where your operations are, uh, since often the CDFI is funded to work to create a thriving community in a certain area. So. Okay. And can you explain a little bit about what the interest rates look like for CDFIs and how that's typically calculated? So again, every CDFI has different price points for the <laughs> different kind of loans that they do. And so this is going to go by individual CDFIs. However, one thing that unites us is to try to be as fairly and reasonably priced as we can. So we are often below the market of other fintechs and certainly we're trying hard to stay completely away from the loan shark end of the scale uh, but it really does vary by institution and by their product so uh, but I can tell you that our field is dedicated to be fair and responsibly priced credit and so uh, and to come the bells and whistles we add are often the technical assistance, the personal touch, the willingness to credit build with you. So that's why I'm encouraging folks to look us up and see if we're an appropriate partner. Great. Well, so many wonderful questions. So thanks everyone for writing in. Um, for the questions that we didn't get to, please know that we have so many resources on ToriBirchFoundation.org. Um, we have definitely shifted our focus to be COVID specific and really want to be that navigator for you. So please visit our website and check out all the tools, all of the lists and links um, that link to SBA and, and different resources that are available to you. Uh, before we go, I'd love to hear one piece of advice that each of you have for business owners in this time that, that we didn't touch on. Um, I'll go first. You know, I think that in any crisis, there's opportunity, right? And as business owners, as self-employed individuals, this is going to be a really great moment to work on the long-term planning of our businesses. What are the steps that we are taking to make our businesses thrive once we go back to a stronger economy? And so I think it's making sure you do things like PPP, both applying and getting forgiveness, but then also running cash flows, getting a bookkeeper, making sure you got a tax professional, building a relationship with a bank who's going to help you grow. And it's all the basic stuff that when we're running around get starting a business, we don't really have time to think about, but this is the time to do it. Great, thanks Megan, my pleasure. I just have to echo what Megan said. Let's use this crisis. It's a horribly difficult time, but let's use it well. And my biggest advice is the point I've already made. Please get to know us. I thank Tori Birch for a chance to make the case that there are a set of lenders out there who want to be on your side. And those are the nation's community development financial institutions. So please check us out and get to know us. Well, thank you both. Two financial first responders right here. We so appreciate your time. Thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Take care.